Alrighty, so this is podcast number 31. Uh, we are blessed to have Matthew Bradford on today. Um, you know, when I started this whole podcast journey slash experience, um, Matt was always at the top of my list of, you know, who I wanted to have on and talk with and discuss things with. So, and we've been talking about it essentially for what, a year and a half, two years? It has been. Yeah. So, uh, negotiating diligently with Matt's people, he's got an authorized, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, finally, finally, uh, you know, blessing us with your time and we appreciate your time so much thank you so much yeah i told my wife this morning actually when when you come to my house to like just walk up to you with a bunch of papers and like are oh, you got to sign this here's the fee it's uh um, you know, it's like yeah. but uh i was yeah. hoping not to get the text hey man something came up not gonna be able to do it so it's it's kind of surreal to be here it seems like it's it's been a long time coming and you know we really appreciate it um i was telling you before the podcast i you've got so many titles and, and so many things going on um i, I was just going to let you introduce yourself so um how do, how do you tell people who you are and, and what you're about now yeah uh, you know again thank you for coming over and letting me be a part of your podcast and um you know always always look you know for those who i've known a long time and i consider close friends you know always you know put you all first i know it's been a year and a half since we've talked about this and we planned this right. out but uh you know, I know you're busy, man. It's hey, okay. I, I got to put my got my uh, closer people first, you know. I appreciate so, that, man. Thanks but you know, it's a. Uh, I mean, I did, I've gotten uh, throughout my life, you know, 32 years old. I've gained so many different titles, and I got a couple of new ones now. With, yeah. You know, being a father and a husband, but you know, I just, uh, I, I truly, you know, for anybody that calls me my military rank, Corporal Bradford, that means a lot to me because it it lets me know that. You know, for seven years I served, and you know, you, you're an NCO in the, the Marine Corps, and that's a you know, you know, it's E4, but it's a you know, a lot of hard work, and you know, people above you, it says a lot because you made it to that rank. So I right. mean, Corporal Bradford, I mean, that, that works, or just call me Matt. Right. You know, so it's, it's a, I've been called many things in my life, good and bad. So how do you how do you designate that? Um, because I know you guys in the Marines have a saying: "Once a Marine, always a Marine." So do you say retired? Uh, former Marine, how, how does that go? I say retired because uh, I mean I was medically discharged 100%, and you know with with being 100%, I kind of could take the retired gotcha. part and stuff. So, but you know it's a never, never a former Marine. You're always a Marine. Oh, that's what I'm saying. So. <laughs> I, I typed that out in one of the messages. I was like, he'll kill me if I put that. Yeah. So I gotta I gotta back that out. Yeah. So um, you're talking about how you know obviously I've known you for a long time. Um, and there's a lot of things that I don't know about your early life. Um, were you actually born in Winchester? I was actually born in Petersburg, Virginia. My, um, my dad retired from Virginia it's at Fort Lee because he worked for the Defense Commissary Agency, which is kind of your commissaries on military bases. And he, their headquarters is based out of Fort Lee, and I was born there in 1986. My mom and dad were divorced. I don't know exactly how old I was, a year, maybe earlier, but... All of my mom's family is from Winchester. Even my dad's family is from up in Lewis County, northern Kentucky. And so once they divorced, we moved back here, and it's kind of where I grew up. So you moved back with your mom? I did. Okay. Yeah. And, and would you spend summers with your dad, or? I did a lot of holidays. We would we, he would come pick me up. We'd go up to my grandpa's uh, farm up in Lewis County and take sixty four over to his house, and I'd spend the spring break, summer, the holidays with him. And when school started, I come back and. And it was a. Uh, how, how were you when you moved to Winchester? Uh, it was, I mean, a year too old. I can't even remember. I just, uh, it was very. It was. I was young, and lived there. We lived in many different homes, and it was just kind of my, my mom was somebody that was paycheck to paycheck, and right. you know, I, 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 I don't talk about it much, but it kind of like growing up. It that's what kind of steered me to going out and you know playing basketball on the street or playing baseball, just kind of staying active and. You know, and doing my own thing. It helped me kind of, it humbled me and it helped me realize, you know, later in life to take everything for granted, you know, because, you know, the life I live now is completely a 180 from what it was growing up. And, right. But, you know, I, I learned to appreciate, you know, the smaller things of Christmas. You know, I'm not going to get loaded down with a bunch of gifts. And, and, and it helped me when I moved to live with my dad after my freshman year in high school because my dad had a good job. He retired from the government at 35 years, and but he grew up on a farm. He knew how to work, and he knew what he had a good work ethic. And um, so I knew, 
he didn't spoil me with you know a retirement paycheck with money that he earned you know I still had to work for it and it's kind of helped push me to who I am today for know? sure yeah see I was uh, I was spoiled as a child and I think that uh, you know we didn't really have a lot of money but my my grandparents always you know anytime I needed shoes new baseball glove cleats basketball shoes didn't matter I got whatever I wanted mm -hmm. and I and I've always seen a correlation with that and work ethic and so you know if you're if you're a little bit more humble kind of growing up i think it i think it makes you work a little bit harder throughout life and you know you come to the realization at one point in time that life isn't a fairy tale and you're gonna have to work pretty hard yeah. and you know it, it's i think it's very invaluable that you learned that at a, a very early age and i think that's the one thing i've learned with my mom and you know my stepdad who truly raised me he taught me everything from you know baseball you know he was out there on the street playing basketball with us and he was the the one male figure i had in my life because although i, I love my dad to death he just you know when it comes to sports it was my stepdad you know my yeah. dad tried to get out there and play sports with me but it was just it wasn't it you know right. and um but you know i learned that i always loved tax time because that's one time we had some money we can go eat a nice restaurant you know and it was you know, my, my mom and my stepdad, we, we did a lot of uh, dinty more beef stew, beanie weenies, you know, it wasn't, yep. it wasn't great, but it was, it's learned, you learn to love those things and accept it, you know. Do you ever find yourself craving that old stuff just out of nostalgia? It's funny because, you know, we, you know, somebody asked me on Monday what I ate in the military when we were deployed and I was like, you know, it was a lot of MREs, but once you started getting mail, you started getting a lot of cans of Vienna sausages and little beanie weenie cans. And, yeah because you didn't have to heat it. You could just right. pop the top and, you know, take a spoon and go for it. And it's, uh, I don't really ask for it much now because it's, <laughs> it's worn on me over the years. And I don't know if I could eat beanie weenies and Vienna sausages anymore or well, cup of noodles. Well, I actually found myself, I was in the soup aisle and I found myself craving Dinty more beef stew. That's the reason I asked. Yeah. It just kind of brought <laughs> nostalgia back to, to the childhood. Um, where did you, where did you go to elementary school at? I, we didn't go to school together then, did we? No, I, you know, that's the one thing with my mom was like, we moved around so much. Like I went from, I was in Cheer, I think. Okay. That's where I started. Second, when it, right before it burned down, I was at Cheer. Oh, then I, I went it to, didn't burn down until my brother was in there. So I was actually already out. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Cause then I was, I went to the, uh, the older one. Right. Yeah. And then I went to, uh. Fanny Bush for a year, and then I finished uh, fourth, uh, third grade. I was in Hen McClure, fourth and fifth. I was in Stroh Station, and then went over to Clark Middle. And I think pretty much, how old, I think fourth grade is when I started playing baseball for the Giants in Little League, and because I, I started out in minor league with the Braves, and when I was nine years old, and kind of. I think that's when I kind of met you all and stuff like that. And that yeah, I think uh, I think we had some interactions at Clark Middle because I went there during sixth grade. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Okay. I think so. Yeah, and I think maybe it. even a little bit before that, I think uh, my mom worked at uh, Dr. Baker's. Did you live around there at one point in time? I can't remember the street that it was off of, but for some reason I thought maybe me and you had saw each other on the street one time and hung out and talked about it, but I could be wrong about that. But I know, I know for certain that we... Uh, went to Clark Middle together that first year, and then I actually transitioned over to Magnet School in uh, seventh and eighth grade, but uh, in Concrete. But I know I know we had some interactions uh, then, and obviously through sports. So you, you played minor league when you're nine, and then transitioned over to little league, yeah. And then um, <clears throat> I knew uh, Ryan Bennett's dad really well, gotcha. and, he, and he was our. Yeah. You know, uh, I think my first year at the Giants, he was. I want to say he was one of the coaches, but. You know, playing fall ball, and I think that's the one thing that kind of you create a lot of relationships, especially for us through baseball. Like you know, I met a lot of people just playing baseball and little league, and and it was just a. But yeah, I transitioned over right for my ten ten year old league, and and it was a, it was fun though. I enjoyed it. It was yeah. Um. So you're talking about fall ball and meeting people. Yeah, I think I think you're right, and I think it's something that the young kids don't do these days. I know that like little league programs are struggling. Uh, basketball programs are struggling and I think that it was really something that you've developed these relationships that obviously last a lifetime because even though we we're kind of playing against each other obviously I met you before that I know who you were mm -hmm. and uh did you pitch a whole lot when you were 12 or was our I, I you know there was uh I'm trying to I think I started three or four games you know my best game I remember was uh it was a Monday night game and we played the Mets 
and I miss school. God, how do you remember that stuff? I tell. I'll tell you when I go through my my rehab. <laughs> <laughs> but as a, I uh, pitched against the Mets, and I missed school that Monday because I was at my aunt and uncle's all day Sunday, wow. and I got sunburned. So I had sunburn poisoning. But I went out, and I. I, I remember I had 10 strikeouts, and I pretty much had a no-hitter until the fourth inning. You threw really hard. And that was, that's why I saw my trainer yesterday, like, because I was telling him about doing this podcast with you. I was like, yeah, you know, I you know, I threw hard for what it's like with you being so tall. I kind of left it right in your kill zone, and that, that well, thing just... <laughs> I think um, I think you might be misremembering it a little bit because it was high and outside. It was a pretty good pitch, and I just kind of... I, I think you blew the first two by me. I think the first one might have been a called strike. I know I missed the second one, and I was thinking, surely he's not going to throw me to the fastball, but you did, and it was high and outside, and I just threw my <laughs> hands at it. And you threw so hard, and I swung so hard, the ball just left off the bat. Yeah, that was – and, you know, 12-year-olds, when I really started kind of pitching, I, Brent Chapman was our main pitcher. Yeah. And I, I went in a lot of time for relief, but a few games I started, and – I, I, you know, little league, my 12 year old league, I played first base a lot and then center field. I love playing center field and being in the outfield. And I mean, you, you watch, you know, then was Andrew Jones was, the, you know, I love the Braves, watching them on TBS every night. Yeah, so I, they were always contenders. And you know, there was, you know, just something you don't see today, but I would, I had an old backboard and I would sit up against a privacy fence and I'd take a tennis ball and I'd practice pitching against yep, it. And, I did the same type and of stuff. If, and if, it, if you needed to, I'd put like even the, the trash can right there as a batter, you know, and yeah. just kind of worked on your movement and yeah. stuff. And Which, did you have any off speed stuff? I threw a, I threw a circle change a lot and that was kind of my off speed, you know, and you know, I can't even think of the right name, but a two two finger fastball and four yeah. finger, you know, and kind of changed up that way. But the circle change in the fastball was the two that I relied I, on the most. I joked with you in text the other day. I said if you throw an off speed pitch, I just would have hit it out to left because <laughs> I hit it out to right. <laughs> yeah, because I, I couldn't remember because if you hit it off the light pole, or the, I hit it off the light pole. Okay, because then I remember uh, you remember Josh Leslie with the Red Sox. Yeah, I threw <clears> him <throat> one too, and he hit it off the scoreboard. Man, you had some bad luck. Uh, yeah, mom was infamous, oh, yeah. man. All the old men that saw on the wires been they had asked me about I actually brought something today for you um, the, from this and I'm hoping that it brings back some nostalgia so stick your hand up that's the ball that's the ball you hit the home run yeah. on huh <laughs> yeah. if you feel um, right here on the right there underneath your thumb yeah that's where it hit the, the flagpole yeah it's a uh, it's amazing like you know that's a lot of people like when I moved to uh, live in Virginia like I, I quit playing baseball after really? the 13 year old league because I just I signed up for senior league and I just I think I was like worn out with it. I just wasn't into it no more. And but I mean, I love like looking back on it. Baseball is something I wish I'd stayed with because I, I loved it. Just getting out there, being with the guys, and you know, and just being a part of the team. And you, you were know. talking about um, your mom saving. Or I think it was your mom, right? That saved all the, or was it your dad that saved all your trophies and stuff? My dad did. Okay. And, uh, yeah. That so was... my mom saved all that stuff. She made the scrapbook. So I went into a rubber made container and I found that the other day and I was like, man, I have to bring it and talk about it because <laughs> you know it's. You know, in your situation with not being able to see a lot, I just thought that maybe feeling it and putting it back in your hand again would bring some type of nostalgia back. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing now. It's like you just, baseball is a lot smaller than no, it was back crazy. in the day, you know? It's, it's it feels like you can wrap your whole hand around it like twice or something. Yeah, because I know, like, even like a basketball, it's like you try to, like, I mean, you can easily palm a basketball now, but back in the day, your hand's not as, you know, big as it is right. now and stuff. But that's the one thing, like, just things like this is, like, it makes you miss baseball. It's like you hit a home run and somebody runs out and grabs it and brings it back to you. I know, it's, it's like, weird. It was weird. And then you, get to, you get to take it and keep it. And yeah. It's, it just made you feel almost like a big league or something. Did you hit any home runs when you were I did, and I hit a lot of doubles. <laughs> Hit them off the fence a lot, but it, it's the one thing. It's 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 weird because like at practice, like I would just drill the ball. We yeah. practiced out there behind the movie theater, which I think is now they're putting a hotel in there. Yeah, there's a, it's actually where they used to practice. Is there's like a lake. They made like a little pond or lake. Oh, and then but it's like in practice, like I would just drill the ball and drill the ball, and then you get in the game, and it's like all right, especially when you get like. There's a picture that doesn't throw it as hard, and you just kind of like try to team off, you know, and it's yeah. like it never works you out. Like you like know? swing. Yeah. Um, did you? So you said you quit playing after 13, and we actually played together when we were 13. Yep. And uh, we won the city championship. That was like one of two that I won, and I played in like maybe six or seven. Mm -hmm. So that was a really cool moment because we we actually came from behind. Um, do you remember anything about that year? Um, I remember the um, yeah, because we hit it was uh. What did we play? Seven innings in junior league? Was that what? Or six or seven? Yeah. I remember. Yeah, because we were up about it last, and I think we were down, and mm -hmm. they hit a ball to the second baseman, and and, and our buddy in, I think he fumbled it, and we scored and won the game that way, yeah. right? Is that how? Well, it was? 
Um, so I hit it. I, for some reason, I thought it was one of the Clarys, but it might have been in. You it, might be right. Um, but I just he called him out on the. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, but yeah, so I hit it to one of them and he fumbled it and I actually slid head first in the first. Mm -hmm. And then I stole second and third. Josh Barnes got, no, no, I stole second. Josh Barnes got a single and I think he stole second. And so we had men on second and third. And I think it was Patrick Botner or somebody mm -hmm. hit it to second again and we ended up, I scored. And then there was some type of bobble or error. And I, didn't, I never saw what happened behind me. I just know that Josh ended up scoring behind me. And I ran up to Patrick Bachner and I was like, you know, we were celebrating. He goes, we just won. I was like, what are you talking about? And I turned around <laughs> and saw Josh there. And I was like, how did this happen? Because yeah, we were down like two to one or something like that. I mean, it was two uh, or something. It was it was a close game. Yeah, it was and, two to one. Yeah. And when you sent that picture of the championship, I like thought about it. And I told my cousin when she's at our house last week, I was like, that's the one game that my grandpapa went to. Oh, man. It was a city championship game. And that was, I mean, playing, we played for the Giants. We were never in that situation. So being yeah. in that situation, I mean. Of course, our team was loaded. You know, it was basically between us and the, um, uh, were they the Giants as well? Giants. Yeah, yes. it was basically yeah. between us. That was Ron Bennett's team. Yeah, the the, the Yankees were okay, and the Braves were just horrible. You know, yeah, like, Yankees had gross in them on it. Um, yeah, man, that was a wild night. And I think looking back on it now that we're sitting here in this podcast, isn't it crazy that me and you were side by side and holding our trophies up? That's yeah, the, that, that picture I shared. Yeah, because that you know, looking back uh, then. I mean, I didn't even know we had anybody took pictures. I'm sure we, you my know, mom did it. But yeah, that was pretty awesome. Yeah, and my uh, when we had this house dedicated to us, Keith Barnes come over and he was uh, got a chance to see him for the first time since I mean, probably then because right at the, that was that was summertime of when I was 13 years old. And I think I, I signed up for senior league the next year, and I think that was the summer that I moved to live with my dad in Virginia. It's wild, man. And it's a uh, but yeah, it was a, uh, it was fun though. It was a, uh, you know, just playing sports, and I think for the Giants, you know, like when I played there, not winning all the time, that that kind of teaches you a lot, and you understand in life that right. like, you're not going to win everything, you know, and it takes hard work to go out and do these things, and but you know, you enjoy every minute of it, you know. I had, especially you know, when I was pitching and stuff, I hated getting out there, getting like you know, with, when I played you all on the Red Sox. I mean, I got railroaded. <laughs> yeah. I mean, y'all, you said was twelve to one was a score. I mean, every time. Yeah, it was something like, like that. It was, <clears throat> but I don't think you started that game. I could be wrong. Because yeah, uh, I, I come in, I went into relief a lot of times. Like in, you know, I, I remember. I think I pitched almost. It might have been almost like every game, some kind of like you know, in in one of the innings and stuff. And, that's probably the best way to do it because I think that essentially, and I don't know how Josh uh, Barnes ever did it because you know he ended up playing for Moorhead. Yeah. But. Um, Man, by the time I was like 15, 16 years old, it seemed like my arm was just like used up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, pitched from the time I was nine, you know, until I was uh, 18. And, man, my arm was just, it was just over. It's amazing to me that, like, guys can play so long in the majors and, like, somebody like Josh that we know can go on to, to, to play for college. And, you know, because he threw so hard and he, he was pitching the same amount of time I was, plus AAU ball, all-stars. Yeah. All that stuff. It's just wild that somebody can did, have that much life in their arm. Did you play high school all four years? Yes. Did you no, play? no, no. no. Um, I played high school baseball for two years, yeah. and I played basketball for three years. And I was, I was kind of um, – I guess this is a good time to transition to your move away because you moved away, and I just remember – that. it seems like that was back before, like, you had the world at your fingertips like now. And, you know, I always liked you, always enjoyed hanging out with you, talking to you. And I just remember like kind of looking around in baseball and you know, you would see people kind of fade off and, and where we didn't go to the same middle school and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't remain as close, but I, I didn't know, I didn't know that you had went to GRC for a year. Yeah. I went my freshman year and I, the one thing I remember the most and you know, September 11th when it happened was my freshman year and like yeah. walking from Votech, I was in carpentry and Matt Holland was coming in the other direction and he mentioned something about, you know, plane flying in the building. And going that whole day at GRC, because I, I think that's when you and I had a math class at the end of the day. Um, I can't think of the name, but it was a- uh, I was in stupid math, so. <laughs> oh, you know, I was right there next to you then, yeah. But I, I, I just remember going home that night and, you know, it was just, uh, nobody was on the streets. It was so quiet and, you know, I, I had fun GRC, but during that time, my mom and my stepdad kind of split up oh, and man. she was going through so much and, 
you know, so much where she got in trouble. And when I went to go visit my dad that summer, he was like, no, you're, you're staying with me now. So wow. like, I didn't even tell anybody I was moving. And, you know, I'm sure sophomore year when I had like, you know, my, like Matt Holland was one of my best friends. And he's a good guy. I and, saw him the other day. I didn't know that you guys were close. Yeah, I tried to, um, he don't get on Facebook no, much, but I tried to reach out to him. He, you know, started in the military as well. Yeah. And, but uh, yeah, was, uh, so yeah, started, once I moved out there, he was like, no, you're staying. And they started school first after Labor Day. So I was like, well, heck, I got three more weeks <laughs> vacation, you know, but, wow. but you know, it's uh, I think going to my dad's and living in Virginia, even though it was, it took me out of my comfort zone living in Winchester, truly was the best for me. That's the best situation because, you know, 9-11, I kind of got my mind on what I wanted to do in life. But, you know, there was, I met some really good friends in Virginia as well. And, yeah. you know, got a chance to, you know, play football for varsity my junior and senior year in awesome. high school. I, you know, I, I did. I played basketball for one of the like kind of a rec league there my um, sophomore year, and and it was just you know just getting out, being around people. I had uh, some good friends that kind of like helped get me um, implemented into the school and around the right people. And so it was a uh, you know for those three years that I spent there, I, I, I truly met some good people and was very active in sports. And uh, you know, spring I played tennis. You know, I was. Just coming out one year and it's so funny i, I went out for, for tennis my sophomore year and i had a friend that was already out there and, and they're just looking for people to fill the team and it was like all right matt you're gonna play you're gonna play your friend here and it's like we walked down the court and started hitting the ball around i beat him eight to nothing and like the, <laughs> that's the, crazy the, and all the uh the one seed two seed they like and the coach they said they was like so who won and i was like oh eight nothing and my friend was just he was upset and they was like, oh wow, and you know, and then the junior year, I was I was one seed on both singles and doubles. I, so you you're just like a natural John McEnroe. You didn't even know it. Hey, you know, minus the long hair, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm blown away that you that you didn't. It seems like every time we talk, it's you kind of revert back to baseball. It seems like you have a lot of love in your heart for baseball. I can't believe that you you didn't continue to play it. I am, and you know, our high school, they were they were they were pretty much. You know, they they make it to the region almost every year, and then they play a team around Richmond, Virginia, or like you out in the, the Chesapeake area, where we're playing those bigger schools, and they would lose that. And actually, this past year, I think they made the state semis, and one of their players was drafted by the Padres. Wow! And it's a, uh, I, I, I I just I think once I moved there, I just kind of is getting into something new with baseball, and you know they're they're so used to coming up in like you know like us in little league they had i think they call it the babe ruth league yeah they kind of grew up playing baseball with each other and just a lot of politics and stuff and yeah it's that's like, good. It was, that goes on everywhere man you know that's the one thing when i played play football and tennis and stuff like that it was just it was fun you know it wasn't like you just go out you give you something to do after the, the day of school and you know and tennis like i mean i had a if I got it in, I had a really fast serve. I think I, I clocked me at one time at like 100 miles an hour. Yeah, but I mean, it wasn't going all the time, but it was just fun, you know. Um, so I was looking back at those team pictures, and, and I didn't remember this because obviously um, now, you know, I, I see the way that you are now, but uh, it seemed like you're a smaller guy. So I assume <laughs> that you got a lot bigger after you moved. Yeah, I was a. Uh, it's so funny because my wife didn't say anything about it with that picture, but I was sitting there thinking, I was like, I've been a skinny kid back then, you know, of course, chicken yeah. legs. And it was a. You, you, know, were, you were in the front row, too. Yeah. So that must have mean that you're a little bit shorter. But yeah. Because yeah. I, I, I do, like, you were, what, 6'2? Something like that? I'm six like 6'2 and a half, and I, and I kind of peaked pretty early in life. So by the time middle school was around, I was probably 6'1, 6'2. And, I, you know, 120, 130 pounds. I think I was a. Like 130, 140 pounds when I started high school. So. Yeah, and that's like when I when I moved there. I mean, I was, you know playing football and stuff. I got in the gym, but I didn't get like big. You know, I was still skinny. You, you probably got taller though, right? Yeah, you know, and I don't even like with the prosthetics now. I don't even know how tall I am. Now. I mean, six you, you got to be now. six six foot six one now. Yeah, with prosthetics. And, and you know, so I was like, I was tall and skinny, but um, you know, after I got hurt and stuff, like I didn't really start working out, you know, until now. Because, you know, in the Marines, like, I, I ran a lot. And I did enough. Didn't pull up some crunches and yeah, stuff Yeah, I've like seen that. your pictures. You were pretty skinny. Yeah, so it was, uh, and, you know, it's, it's funny because, like, I was, I could, you know, infantry. We were, we were built to put a flag jacket on, carry the weight, carry the load, and, like, and walk a lot. We did a lot of hikes and stuff, you know, and I was on point. So that's the one thing that I could do the most. Like, you know, I'd, I'd just step it out with a big pack on my back and go to town, you know. And, yeah. But um, probably probably smelling like ammonia because your body fat was too low and you're burning up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> muscle. 
Yep, and that was it. Was fun though. It was, uh, but you know, kind of graduating high school, and that that was my whole goal. Like you know, I was. Well, I want to circle back to something before you talk about that. So, um, I think from our generation, one of the most important days um, in the way that we felt about things was nine eleven. Mm-hmm. And you talk about remembering exactly where you were. Um, I was actually in the computer lab that day, and Robbie Pace, the super smart kid, do you remember him? Uh, he he ran in and he opened the door and he said, "America's under attack." Yeah. And I was like, "What?" You know, none of us knew what to think. And in the very next class, I had Miss Humble for history, and she put on the TV to the time that the the towers. No, I take that back. She actually turned the TV off when people started jumping out of the towers. Yeah. And so I've always kind of wondered, uh, transitioning uh, to your high, post high school life like is was that the determining factor of you going into the military was there something else that that went on that made you decide uh, you know what, what was your thought process because you know um, I was kind of caught in between going to the military and going to college and had a lot of different factors you know girlfriends parents that wanted to steer me other ways and it kind of changed my thought process on what I wanted to do um, but you know what what were you thinking whenever you graduated high school and if you were certain about the military what made you so certain of of actually going pretty much watching those towers and going home that night after school and seeing like the neighborhood was empty nobody was out and watching the news clips of you know the towers crumbling down you know people leaping for lives thinking it'd be better to jump out of a window you know than burn to death and you know finally getting to toll you know the nearly 3,000 lives lost you know and that that was the ultimate reason why I wanted to join the military because I wanted to make sure that would never happen again. Like I wanted to deploy right then, and and I knew as a freshman in high school I still had three years to go, but I was going to do everything I can to make sure that when the time come when I turned 18 years old that I could sign that paperwork and go. And were you already uh, I assume in talks with uh, you know recruiters? Was it Marines all the way? It, it wasn't. It was a, when I turned. Like I turned 18 my August of uh, just before my senior year, so once I got that, I kind of could do it my, on my own. I didn't need my dad's signature, and um, but I was I had a couple friends that joined the Marines. They were through the delayed entry program, you know, and so I was hanging out with them a lot, and I was hanging out with the recruiters. But it's funny when I look back because my dad was in the Air Force, and the Air Force was the first thing I, I thought of. Yeah, and I was looking up some of their special forces. And I was like Googling like it. Like SOAR or whatever. Yeah, I was Googling it and I was like, their school was, you know, a year and a half long before they even get to a unit. And I'm like, no, that's too long. I want to go right away. And, you know, I was actually at the um, Fort Lee gym playing basketball with a bunch of guys and the Marine Corps recruiter was there. And we started talking and he took us to Hooters and we started <laughs> of hanging he out. Did. Yeah, we started, <laughs> you know, trying to get that quota, you know. Yeah. And uh, we started hanging out and. The next thing I know, I'm like, you know, this is what I want to do, and I started. I signed up through the delayed entry program. Did the, um, I think it was December of my senior year in high school. So then all I realized is I just need to graduate to give them my diploma. I've already through the MEPS process and wow. and like all that they gave me the date. All I needed to give them was my diploma. And when I graduated high school in June of 2005, I gave them my diploma, and by September 6, which Funny thing is, that's the first day in sc- of school in Virginia. So it's like here I am on a bus going to uh, Paris Island, South Carolina, and kids are starting school. And um, it was uh, I went down on a buddy program with with one of the friends. Oh, like, that's awesome! He was one of the he was the first people I met when I moved to Virginia, and he's the one that kind of oh, cool. got me involved with some of the groups and some of the people there. And I got to be real close with him and his family. And uh, so we were on a on a actually a van headed down to Paris <laughs> Island. Yeah, it was a it's so funny because like once we, uh, you know, it was a very talkative group of guys and some of them are still friends with today. And um, But like once we got crossed on to the gate, passing the guards, that van got so quiet. Yeah. And it was like, you know, they always try to time it where you pull up in the middle of the night. That was probably your oh shit moment, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was, uh, mine was kind of, yeah, because it's like people ask me like, what about, how was recruit training? How was that? And I'm like. And the first couple of days, I mean, like the first two or three days, like like you're constantly going because they're integrating you and getting you, you know, you know, all your gear, all your supplies, uniforms and everything, paperwork. So it's just go, go, go. And, you know, there's no sleeping. And then once you meet your senior drill instructor and all your drill instructors, it's like that's when it hit. It's like, oh, my gosh, what the heck did I do? You know, it's like because they literally 
make you feel like you're dirt at the bottom of somebody's shoes because they're getting right. the civilian out of you they're and turning you down. into a marine. Yeah. yeah. Did you did you find uh, I've never really talked to a lot of people about basic like as far as what what their experiences were, but did you find being an athlete that it was um, that the the actual physical part of it was it difficult for you at 18 years old or was it a pretty much a breeze? I think it was. Yeah. Uh, I think being an athlete and playing sports and you know running a lot it kind of helped out you know because that's your physical fitness um but then I, I realized early on that no matter if you're perfect all day long they're going to yell at you no matter what you know it's just give and take and but it's looking back on it it's like i hated it then but i, I you know I, it's it's fun to look back on because it's like you know it really wasn't that bad you know it's 13 weeks and it went by so fast because they keep you so busy and it's uh you know it's it's uh it, it, it's truly to come from somebody that moved around so much and then finally got situated with his dad you know because his mom had some problems and and now to wear the title as the United States Marine and actually serve something greater than yourself and you know it's like the, it was it was a very it was a humbling moment but it's something that it's like this is what this is finally what I want to do with my life it's like I feel like I'm pointed in the right direction and let's go, you know. Yeah. And did you did you find that it brought you closer with your dad since you had lived with your mom for so long, and, and you said you really didn't click with your dad as far as sports and stuff goes? Uh, once you put that uniform on, you're officially a Marine. Uh, did it change something in your your father son relationship? Or I think my dad was worried when he found out that I was joining the infantry and the Marine yeah. Corps because he's he, he's like one of his questions after I got home from uh, signing up kind of through the delayed entry program. And uh, he was like, you know what infantry does, right? And I did. And like, you know, I wanted to deploy. I wanted to go overseas. I didn't want to sit around and fight the war over here in the United States. I wanted to be in the front lines. And right. so he was a little hesitant of that, you know, and he couldn't make any, he couldn't have any say in it. It was my decision because I was 18 years old. But my dad and I, you know, I thank God every day that I, that, that he was my dad because he took care of me. He brought me in at the, the, one of the worst times in my life, you know, because right. I was so close to my mom. My mom yeah. was my best friend and I, she raised me and I lived there with her. And, you know, through her struggles, my dad brought me in and he took care of me. And so me and my dad, our relationship has grown over the years. And even when I joined the Marine Corps, it was still, it was okay. It wasn't, you know, best friends. It wasn't like an aha moment or something. Yeah, yeah and you know, and it's like, once you go to through boot camp and then you, like I graduated a couple of weeks before Christmas, so I had Christmas time off and you know, first of January, I checked in at School of Infantry and I was there for three months. And then once I graduated from there, I was basically on a plane headed to Hawaii. So it's like, there was really no time to sit down and talk to my dad and go, think about anything. Yeah, you know, it was just go, go, go. And, yeah. and you know, when I was, you know, and when I was at boot camp, like I wrote home to him a lot, you know, and I, cause that's all the only communication we had. And then, you know, through school of infantry, they took your phones from you and like, you got them on the weekends. So it's like, you know, when I'm on the weekends, it's the one time that we actually can get off base maybe. And the f fun thing for us, a bunch of 19 year olds, it's like, let's just go get a hotel room and eat like, you know, Texas Roadhouse. It's not like, you know, we that, that was getting <laughs> off base. It's like, you finally got good food and you don't have to sleep in a squad bay and wake up at the, you know, butt crack of dawn. Um. Are are both of uh, are both of your parents still living? They are. My uh, my mom. I, unfortunately, I don't really talk to her much. I haven't in a few years. My dad. You know, uh, we've we've kind of settled, and we've had a greater relationship now than it was then. And you know, and I know you want to talk about my injury and stuff like that, but a lot of that we had to kind of rebuild our own relationship. Yeah. And but he lives in Virginia, still living there, and so awesome. But, was there ever any thought for any other job other than infantry and, and Marines? No, I, I, when I signed the paperwork, you know, December of 2004, then it was Marine Corps for 20 years, deploy as many times as I possibly want. I, I just, I didn't think of, I didn't have any plan B that was plan A through Z right there. And that that's, was it. That's the way to live, man. Yeah. You know, you always, they always talk about like having no parachute or no, no exit strategy and and you know i'm glad that you found that freedom so early in your life because like i said from my point of view i was really kind of torn by about three or four different things that i wanted to do with my life and i wasn't really certain of it and you know i had so many outside factors telling me to do this pulling me different ways and 
you know, I, I can't imagine the freedom that you would have had to to know that that's where you belong, what you wanted to do, and yeah. everything like that. So, and that's the the one thing that I look back on that I wish I kind of did have a plan B because you know, on on the on the one on that one day, you know, that special day, I kind of I had to really look at life now. It's like, what am I going to do now? You know, it's like I was an I was an okay student. I you know bare minimum because I realized I want to join the Marine Corps and all that. They needed was my diploma. Right, you know, so I you're not worried about. You yeah, know, I wasn't worried about going <clears> to <throat> college or anything. Yeah, and that's that so. makes sense. Um, so before we get to your, you know, the the alive day for you, um, what uh, what was your experience like leading up to that? Um, so you're 18 when you joined. Uh, by the time you got out of boot camp, you're still probably 18 years old. Actually, I jo- actually, I joined. Uh, I went to boot camp two weeks after I joined. I uh, turned 19, so I was. Okay, so you're already 19. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was, I loved every minute of it, you know? It's like, you, especially being stationed in Hawaii. I mean, I didn't want to be stationed in Lejeune. I didn't want to be stationed in Pendleton. For me, Lejeune is so much like Kentucky and Virginia. It's like, I, I knew what that area was like, you know? And I wanted to actually get out and see the world, you know, as a lot right. of people say. And Marty was actually in Hawaii, too. That's, yeah, that's he, strange. He got school full of barracks, right, or something like that. Or I, I, you, I don't know all the, yeah. the specifics, but I, I know for sure that he he was stationed in Hawaii for uh, I think if, if not the majority of the whole time he was in in the army. Yeah. So, I mean, it was I mean it was getting those assignments when we were at school of infantry right before we graduated. <clears> there was they only told us that only a select few of our company would be assigned in Hawaii and so you're part of that select few so it's almost like a reward well the select few was <laughs> all of us and the whole 11 uh, 0311s in Bravo company the next company to come so it's like well that's a small select few you know and you're right so you know got a chance to fly to Hawaii and it's just and you know it's, it's was a it place. the first time you had really been like kind of out of Kentucky Virginia area or had you traveled a lot? pretty much that was, yeah that's the first time I didn't travel much at all and so it's like Hawaii is just like this magical land, you know. Like it was like the Beverly Hillbillies or something. Yeah, yeah it's funny because we were at school of infantry. There's a couple of guys. Uh, one was from around the Chattanooga, t- Tennessee area. One was from Georgia. Country so, boys. Country and boys. Here we are in the squad bay, you know, knowing that we're going to Hawaii, listening to Redneck Yacht Club by Craig Morgan. Like, <laughs> this is going to be us right here. And, um, did you did you find that at some point in time Hawaii became like almost like a restriction, you know, with it being an island format? My wife actually lived in Hawaii for a little while too, so um, you know I know a little bit more about it than probably the most people. But uh, you know she she lived in Hawaii for a while, and I've always wondered if it became more like a, a prison, like you couldn't escape it at some point, like no outside touch and all that stuff. And that's one thing with being in, in the Marine Corps infantry, like you're always trying to you're always in the field, you know, you're trying to constantly train, and it is a kind of restriction because you're stuck on an island. You got to travel to do any kind of training, and. You know, it, there's so much to do there, it's so expensive, but, you know, after a while, it's like, okay, I mean, you, you as a as an E2 in the Marine Corps, you don't make very much money, and it's like, Waikiki is way expensive, so we might as well just stay on, on base, and, right. but for training, it was it was hard, because it's, there's just not enough room. It seems like that would be like a, a jungle atmosphere, too, so I'm sure a lot of the training was probably miserable, huh? Yeah, we took a, there was an old Air Force base there that they kind of turned into a little mount town, which is like, you know, urban terrain. And, um, you know, so we, we spent a lot of times out there doing a little training ops. And we uh, we actually, we did some makeshift patrols around our base. And, you know, we, we took a chance. We flew to the big island up on one of the volcanoes and we were there for a week and trained up there. And, you know, it's like when you walk out and you look out and all you see is like the lava rocks and stuff, it looks like you're on the moon, you know? It's, right. uh, yeah. And of course it rained the whole week while we were there and we were out in the field. So, Naturally. so uh, that was wonderful. <laughs> that prepared you for the desert, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, how much time actually, um, transpired between when you finished, uh, you know, your basic and then went to Hawaii. Like, so I, I guess once you, once you got out of basic, it was probably like Oh six. Is that right? Oh, December of 05. 05, and, yeah. so right at the end of 05. So you moved to Hawaii or went to Hawaii for the base. So I was like 06. So how, how much more time transpired before you actually got deployed? I got to, uh, I checked into Hawaii in March of 2006. And pretty much the unit just got back from Afghanistan. So we began the, right into a workup for a, a deployment. So from March to September, it was just straight like going into a workup, working on patrols, working on room clearing. 
um, you know, ur back fighting in urban terrain. You know, we we knew we were going to Iraq. We didn't know where at in Iraq, and it was just uh, so we did the PTAs that they call the training on the Big Island for a week long, and then June and June through July, it's like a thirty some day training in uh, the Mojave Desert in California, which was very good time time of the year for that. Nice summer training in hundred some degree heat. But uh, what uh, that's a pretty famous uh, marine base. What what base is that? Twenty nine Palms. Okay. Yeah, we yeah. So that was we were there for a, a month actually, July fourth, two thousand six. My fireworks was watching tracer rounds go over my head. So it was very beautiful. <laughs> but it was a uh, you know we got done there and then by the time that was right around Lone Survivor time too uh, with the the whole Operation Red Wings too I believe because I think Chris Kyle in his book talked about uh, being in California watching fireworks wondering where. You know Marcus and, and his unit was so I think yeah that was uh, time actually yeah that was uh yeah Operation Red Wing yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, it was all around the same time so we were yeah when you know, we were there July fourth was kind of like the I think it was around the last week we were there flew home did a couple other little training things took some classes and stuff and then first of August we did our pre deployment leave come home and it's so funny like I flew from Hawaii to Atlanta Atlanta to Lexington. And of course, my flight from Atlanta to Lexington, my luggage gets lost. Of somewhere. course, naturally. So here I am wearing the same pair of jeans and t-shirt for like three days in a row because my aunt keeps washing it every night. Did you so get to see anybody when you were back? I saw I saw my buddy. Uh, I don't know if you know Stephen Gilvin. Yeah. yeah. He uh because he he lived down the street from me when I lived over um what is it Buffalo Tra Buffalo Trace or Buffalo Hills? Yeah, that sounds right. Sounds and um, like so him and I played basketball together, and we actually ran into each other. I forgot how we even connected. I think we ran each other at Walmart. Like I was walking and he was walking the other direction and he saw me and it's like, hey, you know, so I got a chance to see him. And then um, I was here for for about a week. And then uh, I, I went over to Virginia with my dad and got a chance to hang out with them for a little bit and flew home or flew back to Hawaii. And by the time I got back to Hawaii, it was, we kind of knew the date that we were going to be leaving, but it wasn't for sure. and. One day they just come to it like they was like, all right, pack up your room, and you know just kind of do it your own standby now. And and one standby, you know, ended it about midnight. We we all met in one of those big parking lot, got on the buses, and left Hawaii, going to Hickam Air Force Base, and that was it. Bye bye Hawaii. And so what um, you said you didn't know uh, where you're going to go to in Iraq. You knew you're going to go to Iraq. So what area were you specifically in? We were. You know, the Marines at that time, it was right before the surge, and a lot of the Marines manned the areas in the Al Anbar province, which at that time it was Ramadi, Fallujah, the northern, northern west, or northwestern part of Iraq, which is the most dangerous area right. in Iraq. And, Ramadi and Fallujah. And we, uh, so we were just right up the Euphrates River from Fallujah, I think about 20, 25 minutes up the road. But uh, we were in a town called Haditha, and in 2005 they had the Haditha massacre, which is, you know, uh, an ID blast went off and a couple of Marines were killed and they went into a house and cleared it and they had some casualties and there a lot of investigation going on. Yeah. But in Haditha was the second largest dam in the country. I remember, and, that. Uh, I remember there was a lot of uh, operations to try to save that dam because they were afraid they would blow it up, right? With ISIS, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, if you, it's amazing because like when we were at the, when we checked in, like we went to the dam first and kind of loaded up on gear and, and weapon and um, uh, rounds and stuff. And like you look out on the other side of that dam and all the water, it's like you look think of Iraq as a dry country. Right. It's like so much water, and and if they were blowing that dam up, that would have probably flooded all the way down to probably Fallujah and stuff. And then yeah. it was just. But yeah, we uh, we we flew. It's it's funny when I left. Uh, once we got to, uh, we left the, the the base in Hawaii, and you know you, we entered this tunnel, and it's like so I'm sitting next to my friend, and like we're sitting there listening. I got an earbud in, he's got an earbud in, the same iPad and, or iPhone or iPod. Do you remember what you were listening to? American Soldier by Toby Keith, <laughs> which is like very ironic, you know? Yeah. And we get to Hickle Air Force Base and we're sitting there waiting to get on the plane and, you know, my aunt calls me and it was basically like a minute or two before I turned my phone off to get on the plane and, wow. and it was a, got on there, we flew from Hawaii to Alaska, Alaska to Amsterdam, Amsterdam into Kuwait City. and. Uh, Kind of loaded on the the bus, and that's when I realized that we're going somewhere that w we could die. Was it surreal? It was, you know, because like we get on this bus with like these, they got these curtains and they shut them, and oh, one, wow. of the, one of the guys in our squad or platoon 
he was kind of like our sniper. You know, he loaded his weapon and he looked out the window, making sure nobody would shoot at us and stuff. So and, they did allow you all to have your weapons on the bus at least, huh? Yeah, they, yeah, because it was a uh, American Airlines flew us over, but it was just all Marines. So like our round, or like our weapons weren't loaded or anything, but we still had them. Yeah, that's good. But um, but once we landed, it was uh, it was surreal. Lock and you know? load, huh? We got there and we we actually I think we landed in Kuwait. Either in Kuwait or Iraq. I mean, it was September 11, 2006. So, I mean, like basically a year and five days since I joined the Marine Corps, I was already over in country. And, um, you know, we, we took a C-130 from Kuwait into Iraq, and we were there for pretty much we landed in the morning, and we flew into Haditha that night on a couple of and some um, Chinooks, and landed oh. there on the on the dam. So how, how long were you actually um, in Iraq in country? Was your deployment like supposed to be a year? No, the Marines only do about seven months. Seven months. The Army is more of a year. I think it used to be 15 months. I think they've like lowered it to a year yeah, now. Yeah, I think that they... But uh, yeah, we were... I mean, we got there in September. We pretty much started right away going on patrols. Um, we were on foot patrols the whole time. You know, IED patrols. Uh, we had a lot of suicide... Or not a lot. We had a lot of snipers in the area. And uh, we did a lot of good in that town. You know, that town... I remember when we were in al Saw, the, the unit that we were, were leaving, one of the guys, he was—he looked at us. And he was like, "Man, I feel really bad what you're getting ready to get into," and because well, they, they took so many casualties, and we walked in and we we left off right where they did. I mean, we had a lot of guys get wounded. And oh wow! A lot so of guys, a lot of action, huh? Yeah, I mean, it was it was it was from the start, you know. And but you know, it's like you learn as you go. And like the first patrol I went on, I was scared to death. Like it's like you know, are we doing this correct? I mean, there's so right. much to, to look at and to keep an so eye on. So many variables. Yeah, it's like you're looking down at the ground, make sure you don't step on an ID, you're looking at these windows, and and the whole time it's like, you're fighting an enemy that doesn't have a uniform. Right. You know, this guy can shoot at you from a window and then walk out and shake your hand. Yeah, civilians essentially. Yeah, so it's, uh, it was something, you know, we had a, it's, it's looking back on it, one of our snipers that we ended up taking him down but he was, uh, if you remember the Virginia sniper in 2001, yeah, like that, you know, they shot out of the tail light of the car. Mm -hmm. We had the same guy, like um, two two Iraqis doing the same thing. They would walk, they'd pull up to a curb or an, or an intersection and they'd kind of back up. He'd shoot out the tail light and they'd take off in the car. Wow. And um, we actually, we we handled him. <laughs> Good. We got the best of that guy. But, uh, he, you know, looking back on it, the weapon that he used was an old M16 with an um, ACOG and a, a silencer on it. And it's like so obviously he stole it from somebody. Yeah, he's using there. our weapons to yeah. kill us and stuff. And that's wow. Well. But uh, it was, you know, it was. But again, it's like recruit training. It went by so fast because you were staying so busy. It's like was it was it what you thought it would be? I'm sure that you built it up in your mind as being everything a certain way, and then I wasn't sure if if it was the way that you. It was and. For me, I was like so, I was so motivated in being over there. It's like nothing like getting into a firefight. You're like so freaking pumped. You know, your adrenaline's rushing. And, uh, you know, it's like some days, like complacency would kick in. Right. And that's something, like when I talk to troops today, you got to watch complacency because that's when the enemy will attack, you know, at your weakest, weakest point. But the one thing I loved about being over in Iraq was we were living in a fob in the middle of town. It was just our company. And, you know, we were living out of Iraqi homes, and the house that we had for our platoon, it was just us, you know, and there was, a, we had a, we had a TV in the chow hall, but we, we never had time to go watch TV. The only way we could communicate back home was writing letters. We had a satellite phone, but it was like, we rarely got that. It was just us. It was me and my brothers, and, you know, a lot of the guys I talk to today, they can look back on it as like, you know what, if, if I had you all, you know, if we could all come together to go on one more patrol in Iraq, then we would do it. And it was, you know, you, you always hear about the brotherhood and camaraderie of the Marine Corps. But then being around those guys and you, you see it, you know, and it's, uh, you learn to love that the guy to your left and right is going to have your back no matter what. And he's going to be willing to lay down his life to protect you. And, um, you know, it, the, our brotherhood grew. And it was I always tell people we were a bunch of strangers that come together to become brothers. And what we did in Iraq, you know, we, we walked into a shitty situation at the beginning. And when we left Iraq, it was so quiet and it was so clean and there was no gunfights and no action, no casualties of the, the unit that relieved us. And, you know, we, we took a couple of big punches in the mouth, but we overcome it and we battled through and, you know, just a, 
bunch of 19, 20 year olds. That's all we were. Over there fighting for our freedom. Yeah, that's amazing. And so, how many months in did did um, you know your incident happen? How was it? Was it? Uh, were you close to the end? Was it around the middle? I think it was. You know, we got there in September, and I got hurt middle of January, and about April, first of April wow. into March is when they all left. And you know, we were starting to get the the word that you know, we're, you know, it's getting closer and closer, and you know, it just. Uh, it flew by so fast, you know, and it's like, cause you stayed so busy, you're constantly on patrol, you're on post and, but, uh, you know, on that day it was just woke up. It was a beautiful day in Iraq. It was, the, you know, in the middle of January. Had so, things kind of calmed down or was it still pretty heavy? It was very calm by then, you know, gotcha. and, and, uh, you know, apparently from what I found out about that is like, there was a patrol that kept going up and down that same road. I got hit on over and over again for previous days. And you know the Iraqis, they're not dumb. They're smart. They saw right. that, and and you know it's like you said, complacency. You know, it seems like that it should, somebody should have probably made a determination and switch it up a little bit. Yeah, and that was uh, you know, and, and they were coming from the op like uh, the previous patrols would come from the opposite direction, and here we come from the other direction. And um, I, I woke up, you know, uh, that same day since it was about it was about four o'clock in the afternoon that I got hit. But I mean, we woke up, I think we had a night patrol, so we kind of rested up and actually got a chance to call home. So I talked oh, to, talk to my right. uncle just like a couple hours before that. And I don't know if I jinxed myself or, but I was like, yeah, we're getting ready to come home, you know, a couple more months of this. Gosh. And it's starting to get a lot more calmer over here. And, you know, the one thing I don't remember, I remember a lot of my childhood and a lot of growing up in the Marine Corps and stuff, but I don't remember anything from the briefing to all the way up until the last minute. And you know we were. I walked point every That's single. That's what I was going to ask if you were point because you said you said that before that you had typically walked point. Yeah, I walked point on every patrol. You know, and that's the one thing that out of our squad we took more action than the other squad in our company. You know, we'd go out with twelve marines, but we'd come home with twelve marines. We'd do our job, and we'd let the enemy know that if they want to open up on us, then we're going to give them everything we got. Yeah, and that's going to be the biggest mistake they make. But, and, but so you said you didn't remember up till the moment. Was do you recall any like? Um, I, let's call it spidey senses, but do you recall anything that felt off or um, that felt different to you or was it just like any other patrol for you? Just like any other patrol. I mean, I was like, at then, I mean, I was kind of like, I was a veteran at this, you know. I knew what I was right. doing. I knew what to look around and kind of handle the danger zones and kind of you see something suspicious and you know how to call it out. And that's what I did. We were walking, you know, from the last thing I remember is like you're walking down this street. It laid parallel to the Euphrates River. And um, we're walking past this compound, and next past this compound was this big open area with palm groves, and there was a white bag leaned up against a tree, and that's a very suspicious item because that's how that's how a lot of those insurgents they they mark their either an ID or a weapons cache by something that's out of the ordinary. We found a weapons cache over there one day. It was this big open area next to the Euphrates River with one tree, right, and right below that one tree is a bunch of weapons dug in the dirt, and. Um, so I saw that white bag and I turned around, I let my team leader know to my left and he was on the other side of the road and I turned around and let everybody know behind me and the minute I turned back around I looked down there was a ditch that lay perpendicular from the road that you know went down the compound wall inside a pipe underneath the road and I mean the command wires inside the pipe underneath the road and before I had any time to react it just exploded right underneath me and I mean I was I was awake through it all shrapnel penetrated my eyes right at the blast. Yeah, uh, I remember you telling me that, and it, it's always resonated with me that you said that you could, uh, like one of your last memories was the actual penetration into your eyes. Yeah. And did, did you did you immediately feel pain? You said you could remember all of it. Did you immediately feel pain? Do you remember anybody rushing towards you, or, you or know, how did it play out? I think my body was in such shock that I don't remember any of the pain, but like my left leg was, um, removed from my body at the blast my right leg was severely damaged and of course shrapnel going through my eyes that but uh i mean i was still conscious through it all and so at that point in time even when the shrapnel went into your eyes you could still you had still some type of vision or is that just by feeling just by um um i, I didn't have any vision yet it's the minute that i looked down and it exploded it sent shrapnel right in my eyes and that took my vision right there but like I was awake through it all, you know, I could hear the guys calling QRF and running around me. And honestly, it, it was like, it was a moment, it was like a dream, you know, it's yeah. like, and, um, 
but you know, I, was, I actually had the litter kit in my pack that I was wearing, so they're like trying to get that out and get me on that and stabilize me and call QRF and get them there to get me out of the danger zone. And, and the whole time they're put me, you know, they're trying to put tourniquets on my leg. I'm trying yeah. to stand up the whole time. So it's like, I don't know if it's just like when you, you know, I guess us today, you know, as a guy, like if we run into a thing and it, it we run into something and it hurts. No, I'm going to win that. It's, yeah. like that to me. <laughs> it's like, you just kind of like but shake it off. And it's saying. like, it's like, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen blue collar comedy with Jeff Foxworthy. He's like, yeah, a bunch of guys and, Look what this chainsaw can do. And he cuts his legs off and he just kind of hobbles around. He's like, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. You I know? thought you were going to say the part where he's talking about taking his grandma's medicine and he said he's laying in the backyard and she's like, get up, you wimp. I take two of those before breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying. And, you, and your body and your mind was probably in such shock that you really probably couldn't put two and two together. Hey, this is, this yeah. is not happening right now. And um, did they, I assume that they probably dosed you up on morphine too? Yeah, they, they drugged me up and, um, you know, hearing stories back and from now to then and the one thing that i truly love about the guys i served with is it affects them more than it does me because i wouldn't i have a lot of questions about it you know and and some of them will answer but even some of my best friends they just they get emotional trying to talk about it and um you know i remember laying there i don't remember laying there but they were telling me but i was laying in the compound waiting on qrf and they're sitting there holding my hand because i mean they didn't think i'd live much longer yeah. you know i was complete like i Strike with my eyes. My left leg, left leg was taken off. My right leg was severely damaged. My my intestines were like you know pretty much gashed with shrapnel. You know, as anything could happen to me, I was directly on top of it. And so did it go like underneath your flight jacket? Is that how that happened? It did. Yeah. It's uh and um you know the the last voice when QRF showed up the, was from ironically was my senior drill instructor. He was a platoon oh, sergeant oh, in the gosh. same company and. He was like, you'll be fine, Bradford. And then I passed <clears throat> out. I didn't know if I was dead. I didn't know, but that was the last words I heard. And I pretty much woke up three weeks later in Bethesda. Oh my gosh, you're out for three weeks. Yeah, I was in a heavily sedated coma. I was, uh, you know, I, I lost so much weight. I lost so much, I pretty much lost the body's worth of blood that it's truly amazing that I, you know, survived that. Not to mention the amputations and the Thank effect. God for good medical people. Yeah, and the infections that you could possibly oh, get yeah. from the dirt and stuff over there. And it was, uh, you know, waking up three weeks later, it's like, you know, in a matter of seconds, I'm on a patrol in Iraq with my brothers fighting the insurgents. And now here I am waking up in America fighting for my own life. And how, um, how long did it? take before it sunk in that this is what was this was reality this was what was really going on because i mean i'm sure i don't know if you when you three weeks is a long time to be out so when you woke up were you were you foggy about everything did you know exactly what happened i i didn't I, they told me and because a lot of time like i had a, a trach in and they took the trach out oh, so gosh. i couldn't talk you know for the first couple of days and then you know sitting there in the hospital room, my phantom pains in my legs were so strong that I felt like my feet were still there. And I actually got onto my dad for this because he would always whisper to the doctors over my shoulder. And like, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I'm in Iraq then, now here I am, I don't know where I'm at. I'm like, these, these guys just kidnapped me. They're, they're going to cut my head off here, you know. I, oh I still feel my feet. I feel like I'm blindfolded and I got guys whispering over my shoulder. I never even thought about that. And I'm like, what in the world? And then, um, and you know, once I got home and my dad told me that I lost my legs, I mean, you know, I, I, I got deployed to Iraq and wherever I deployed, there's only two ways I wanted to come home, either in a body bag or with my brothers. There was no in the middle. Yeah. You always see this stuff happening on TV, but you never expect yeah, it to happen to yourself. And you know, I, I laugh about it now, but it's like then I was like, I just, I wish my legs were like a gecko's tail. You rip it off, it grows back, yeah. you know, and here I am, it's like, 20 years old, how in the world am I gonna live my life now? You know, I'm blind, I don't have any legs. And it, it truly crushed me, and that's the one time in my life that I like, I mean, I have emotional moments now, but then it was just like, the end of the world. Like, yeah. I'm done, I don't wanna live this. And, and I felt that depression, that guilt. And the one thing that hurt me the most, like I didn't care about losing my vision, it was losing my legs. And then I also felt like I let my brothers down. Like, and you know, because here they are, they're fighting in Iraq, and I'm over here in America. And um, so when they would call the hospital room and try to talk to me, like, I would always tell them I'm busy. Or I could oh, come wow. up with some lame excuse, you know. And 
And you know, for the longest time, I, I had a feeding tube, and they was like, you know, in order for you to get this feeding tube out, you gotta eat, and I wouldn't wanna eat. Like, I was so weak and skinny, I couldn't even lift my head up off the hospital bed, and you know, the wristband they give you, I mean, my forearms were that big, it would go all the way up to my elbow. Wow. You know, and it was just like, I was done. You know, I wouldn't want to talk to nobody. I, I called a nurse one night at two in the morning. She'd come and try to get blood, and they'd always put the like tourniquet thing on your arm. Mm -hmm. and it was just frustrating. I was like, finally, I get a good night's sleep, and you come here and wake me up. And I called, and she kept poking, 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 not getting any blood. And I called her a stupid moron. And I was like, just go, you know. And and it's just that's how it was. And the nurses just they never gave up on me. The nurses, the doctors, the corpsmen, and the Marine Corps. They were always there when I needed them the most. And um, one of the Marines, he would come in and talk to me day in and day out. I would try to play the whole uh, possum, you know. I was like, just close my eyes and act like I'm sleeping so this go away. And he knew it. And he would always wake me up, but he would always talk about things other than the Marine Corps. He'd be a friend to me. And that's what I was looking at. I was looking at somebody to be a friend. Right. And um, I don't know, it was just one day I woke up and something clicked. How much time do you think transpired? Do you, I mean, I'm sure that you probably know the exact moment, but how long did it actually take you to come around? Because I'm actually kind of shocked to hear that uh, the legs bothered you more than the vision. I, I would I would think that, you know, obviously I can never imagine being in that situation, but um, I would think that it would be the other way around. Like, well, it, it, it is now, you yeah. know. And, um, back then, though. Yeah, back then, it's like, I, I, um, but it was... Valentine's Day of 2007, I received my Purple Heart, and then, I, I mean, I was still in that state of condition. I didn't want to talk to nobody, and really, I don't think I could talk. I think I still had the trach in. Or I didn't have the trach in, but I just got the trach out where I couldn't talk, and so it was a little bit after that, and... Um, how, how much time was that? You said that you, your accident happened in September? Uh, January. January. Yeah, January. Got, okay. Got, so, it was, it was a pretty quick turnaround for you, then. Yeah, because I got hurt. I got hurt January eighteenth, January twenty first. I was in America. I was in Bethesda because they didn't know how. For some I, reason, I thought you had went to Germany too. I, it was in there. Yeah, that's. I think Germany's where my right leg was taken off at. Gotcha. They, so they you have no memory of that at all. We're not, not at all. Like, like, yeah, I was zonked out. I was, but I had some weird dreams too. But uh, um, that DMT trip. <laughs> that's like, what that morphine. They did something to you. They were, but they were um. Yeah, because I, you know, I got hurt on the 18th, and I was in America on the 21st, but in between that, I went to Belaud, I went to Germany, and then, but they didn't know with my eye pressure how the, how I, it would work out f with elevation, so they tried to get me over as soon as possible, and oh, I mean, okay. so I got there the 21st, and I mean, 14th of February, I mean, that's when I got my Purple Heart, and I was in my room, so between that, I was in ICU, I was kind of going through it all, and trying to understand what the heck happened to me, and um, and once, once, once after that is uh, when I could really start talking and just kind of hate my life, you know. And it was, I couldn't even. I was so weak. I was like stuck on a hospital bed, and something just something clicked. I don't know what it was. I think it was the nurses, the doctors, the corpsmen didn't give up on me. They challenged me, and and you know the Marines. And I think that was the biggest thing. They, the nurses and doctors, they helped me realize that I am a Marine. You know, why would I quit? Why would I give up? Because I still am, I'm still a United States Marine. That this is a new mission in my life. That you know what? It's uh, to survive this. You're going to have to suck it up. You're going to have to deal with this because your legs aren't growing back. You're more than likely not going to get vision back. And it helped me realize that there's life outside those hospital doors. And when I when I started getting that kind of mentality, I realized that you know what? These legs and this vision is another challenge for me. And you know what? And people tell me that I can't do something. It gives me the motivation to go out and do it. And, um, you know, I knew, like, I started creating these goals in my head, very broad, some some of them, and some very minor. You know, the minor ones were going from the bed to the wheelchair, the wheelchair out the door, and just rolling around the floor. So did, your, your turnaround was pretty much immediate then? Like, once everything clicked for you, did, were you able to start eating? It, it turn, was. Turning everything around, like, right away. Yep, started eating, and uh, it's so funny, in the hospital, you know, there was a McDonald's on the way from the Navy Lodge to the hospital, and my mom would get me french fries every day, and they're like, a couple of days come past, and they're like, nah, you gotta quit eating french fries. Like, you want me to quit eating McDonald's french fries, but you're gonna give me these like big horse salt pills. It's like, I mean, can't I just like substitute the french fries for this pill that you're giving me? But, uh, you know, once I started eating more, I started moving around, I started interacting more, I started slowly getting taken off medication. And I, and I was literally feeling good. Like the phantom pains were going away. And and it, it just, 
I, I, it, it felt good, you know, and I felt more like myself. You know, I'd still have those days, but I mean, again, I got, I got hurt on, I got in the United States on the 21st, and by March 21st, I was moving to hospitals. So, I mean, from a little after Valentine's Day in 2007 to March 21st, like, I, I got healthy enough and strong enough where I could go to another hospital. And um, it meant a lot. Of, I hated leaving Bethesda because I got so close to the nurses and yeah. so close to the core men. And I'm sure that they pulled you out of the one of the darkest times of your life, obviously. And so you, you have that more than a nurse connection, more than a doctor connection. And they, they did. And, uh, you know, a couple of the core men, like, on those days when I didn't want to do anything, they, they, they pushed me. They challenged me. They even gave me attitude. And I'm like, who the hell are you? You know, you give me attitude, you know? But it's like... That, that's probably what you needed, though. It is, and that, that's it, it really helped me out. And, you know, and, like, I've learned along these last 12 years, like, when I do feel like I'm down in the dumps, like, I look back at that moment there, who, who I was, and, you know, and I, I think about those Marines, and I think about the times they challenged and pushed me to better myself, because they knew, you know? And in 2007, that was... Or 2006 and the seven, that was like some of the worst time fighting in Iraq. And you know, I come back, I was one of the worst injuries coming over. Oh yeah. You know, and but you know, the, like one of the core men, her boyfriend, who just lost a leg, he'd come in and talk to me about his journey. And then one of the the Marines that was in my company who lost a leg, he would he would sneak in Red Lobster <laughs> to me and stuff like that. It's the cheddar uh, bay biscuits. Get oh you. man, popcorn shrimp and cheddar bay biscuits. You know and. And it's it's those people that helped me kind of realize like, and I could do this. It's Are you still close with some of those people? I am. I am actually. I, I uh, went deer hunting with the guy who oh, caught in red wow. lobster awesome. last That's year, amazing. and and he, I forgot all about the red lobster, and he had he reminded me, and I'm like, crap, I remember this stuff now, you know. And it's it's funny that you say that because it seems like that. That's a really good memory for you. And one of my worst memories. I actually look at cars for a living, so I wreck cars. I had to look at a car at a tow lot and it was about 100 degrees and these people had left red lobster in the back seat and so oh. literally the second you open the door you got red lobster I, I have not eaten red lobster since <laughs> yeah, my, my wife from rhode island will not let me eat red lobster she's oh like, you gosh yeah, i'm sure that's like a sin for her <laughs> yeah she's like if you, if you want to eat seafood we'll go to rhode island we'll eat some real seafood that's you know? like that's like eating fried chicken up in rhode island <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and the, but yeah there's a and that's the one thing like along these last 12 years like i've these <clears throat> these stories that are told to me, it, like I kind of, like the whole white bag and the command wires. Like I had that image in my head, and I'm like, why do I have that image in my head? It's like a unstuck on repeat or something. Yeah, and then like one of my friends told me, he's like, you know, you you turn, you saw a white bag, you turn around, turn around and let everybody know. And I was like, okay, that. So I started putting two and two together. <laughs> was and the was the bomb underneath the white bag, or was it leading up to it? It was in a pipe underneath the road. The white bag was probably about thirty feet off. So the it, was it? Do you feel like now looking back on it, it was like a trap? Yeah, that was the white bag was probably used as like an indicator to let them know where that the ID was, and it was probably a command wire. So it was you know once that we got that close, somebody probably pushed a button. And I was going to ask if you thought it was a pressure if it was a pressure plate or somebody actually detonated it. Some yeah, I'm, I'm guessing somebody actually detonated, and and the pipe with it being inside the pipe is that's probably what took my left leg off. I mean. Because they, they said the size of it and what it was, that it would have probably just popped a tire on a Humvee, you know. But other than that, it wouldn't have done much. Well, just the extra compression being in the, inside that pipe or, or actually sending that, the pipe shrapnel out, is that, is that what you think did it? Probably a little bit of all that, yeah. All the, and, uh, <clears throat> so just perfect storm, essentially. Yeah. You know, it is, was, is, that a, is that something that, that you still think about, that there was somebody out there that knew that they hit that button? Is, is that something that resonates with you or that you that you find yourself thinking about from time to time? I, I don't, um, I think about it from time to time because it's, it's so funny that people ask and I'm like, you know, they think of that as like the worst day in my life, but it's the one day that I look back as the, one of the, the turning points. It's like when I'm, when I'm down in the dumps, when I'm hating life, I look back at that moment and use it as motivation. And it's, uh, because cause I, I, I remember that moment, and I remember how I was after that moment. And it's like, you know, I, I saw what I was, you know, I felt like what I was then and what I had to overcome to who I am today. And it's just, uh, I mean, I basically... It's a very had, good point of view to have. I had I mean. to start life over again, you know. There was, there was, it, was either, it was either give up or, you know what, prove people wrong and live your life to the fullest and... Essentially give up or persevere. And, yeah, and, and that was, uh, you know, during that whole time and 
Okay, there was I always took there's two roads that I could have chose to go down. One of them was self pity, guilt, depressed, you know, hating life, drugs, alcohol, suicide. But then there's that other road where there's happiness and there's overcoming and there's a you know perseverance and you know, it's like anything I always told people anything you can do I can do, I might do it differently, but it'd get done. Right. And yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I have but once I got my mind, you know, pointing in the right direction, I started the conquering things you know these goals that i had in my mind and was uh, anybody else injured that day or? my team leader was hurt he had a trap on his uh, right leg um they all, almost had to amputate his leg he had really bad uh, damage done nerve damage done and so essentially by you catching that and stopping people i mean I, I have no doubt that you either saved lives or saved other people's limbs as well and the good thing is as as dispersed as ours Control was what you're supposed to be dispersed. I mean, everybody else was back behind that compound wall too, and like with us being in the front, so the compound wall took a lot of shrapnel and just uh, you know the sec the third the second group of Marines behind us were so far back that you know they heard the explosion and you know they might have had some concussed feeling from it, but other than that, it's like it was just me and my team leader that got hurt. Well, that's that's amazing. So. Um, Fast forward again. I'm sorry to jump back and forth, oh, you're but good. Um, so you, you get out of Bethesda. You leave the the people that you're you've become really close to. Um, did you have somebody that really facilitated and helped you through the whole rehab process? Because I'm sure that it was beyond extensive. The Marine Corps actually they they had detachments there in the hospitals, and during the time that I got hurt is when the Wounded Warrior Regiment was starting up, and which now that's what I'm that's the unit that I was in, you know, and like they were there to help out your family, to help you out, to kind of, kind of help point you in the right direction and know that, all right, you're, you're going to be here for this long. Okay. Once you're done here, you can go like for me, I needed prosthetics. So I was like, okay, you have the choice of either going to Walter Reed or going to San Antonio at the Center for the Intrepid. And, um, so they were there to kind of be your, 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 um, your guidance counselor pretty much, you know? And, but, um, you know, once I, I, I was at Richmond for two months, I, I, that's when I started kind of getting in a wheelchair, being more active, physical physical therapy, occupational therapy. Um, I learned some braille then, you know, started doing a little bit more of that. Like, uh, and but I started getting out more and enter like you know getting go down to the canteen to eat lunch, and you know we went to the mall a few times, and so it was uh, started. Um, uh, I forgot what they called it, but it, you know, just started getting out around the community and stuff like that, and you know, not being essentially afraid. socializing a little yeah, bit. Yeah, socializing, and you know, not being because you know, even then, like I was still didn't enjoy going out because even though I, you could see that I didn't have no legs, I'd always put a blanket on my lap, you know, thinking it's like, okay, this blanket's going to cover up these amputations. Gosh, and you know, and and you know. I, my, you know, I was at the the VA in Richmond, Virginia, so I was like 30, 45 minutes from where I went to high school. So I had a lot of people come and visit me, and I, I, you know, that was something that I was still trying to overcome. Like, I didn't really want people to see me in that condition. Right, right. And um, so it was it was hard. Right, you're you know? essentially feeling shame when there should have never been any shame or, or, yeah. or vulnerability. That might be a better word for it. Yeah, because, and you know, and that whole time, it's like I'm a changed person even before I got hurt. I'm a Marine now. Like I, like I, I just, I felt different being around these people I went to high school with. And now here I am, you know, even more changed because what I experienced. Right. You know, and you probably couldn't relate to anybody either. Yep. I yeah, mean, because I'm ashamed to say that at that time, you know, I was in, I was probably in college. Um, at that point, the military and the war and everything was kind of at the back of my mind. And it was more about women and drinking and partying and, yeah. and stuff like that. And I mean, <laughs> That's pretty shameful to say now, but I can understand how you couldn't possibly relate to somebody like me that, you know, that nobody would really understand your plight, uh, what you were going through. Yeah. Um, how how long was it before you came you came to terms with the vision? Did did they give you any hope from the beginning, or did they essentially tell you from the beginning, look, there's there's no way that you're going to regain anything there? Pretty much from the beginning. I mean, like like I told you before we started the podcast, it was, it was about either this day or this time of March is when I had my last surgery on my eyes, and that was kind of their last, you know, go at it to see if they could fix anything. And you know, it's uh, it didn't it didn't work out, and um, you know, I kind of just learned to 
accept it then. And I started focusing more on strengthening my core and making sure my legs were good to go. And once I got to San Antonio, it's like my, my first priority is learn how to walk on prosthetics because I knew the, the vision loss would come easier if I had two legs to stand on. mobility. And you know, so I'm not like trying to navigate around a house in a wheelchair and so yeah. you kind of you kind of had to let that bridge or that that uh, you know, struggle go to to try to move on to something else, and, and I'm sure that being able to to get out and be on your legs and move around and not have to rely on people as much probably helped you get over that in some way as well. Yeah, and you know it's like and, and look thinking about it now, it's like you know my biggest worry was losing my legs, you know. So it's like okay, give me two prosthetics and get my legs back, you know. Right. Like, where I could be a man again and stand up and look somebody in their eyes instead of looking up at them. And, and that was one thing really why I wanted prosthetics because I didn't want, I mean, maybe somewhat arrogant, but it's like I didn't think there's a lot of people that I need to look up to. Like if I'm going to look at somebody, I'd rather look them in face to face. Right. And um, so it's like, and and I've, I've tried when I was at the Richmond VA, you know, they gave me a wheelchair and a long cane and I tried to like maneuver the wheelchair with the long cane, you know, and it, it was just too hard. And that's when I realized it's like, okay, give me two legs and it's gonna be so much easier, you know, than trying to like push the wheelchair. Is there ever a time now that you're in a wheelchair or is it essentially all always on your prosthetics? I'm on my legs the majority of the time, but like, you know, when I'm at home and I know I'm not going nowhere, then I'll, I'll get take my legs off and be in my wheelchair. It's kind of like- I'm sure that you still have issues with like rubbing or, or pain or, or- They're they're good, you know, they're, um, they're my legs are all calloused up, they're strengthened, they're, you know, and. Like, I, you know, if, if I do, like, rub a sore, then it's part of the prosthetics part. But, like, my legs are, they're good as go, you know, and it's, uh... It's crazy. And, then, and that's, uh, you know, like, pretty much when I got to San Antonio in June of 2007, like, I, I, th I got, I think I checked in, like, the 6th of June, 5th or 6th of June, and by the 29th, I was sent up on my prosthetics for the first time. So, I mean, from January 18th to the end of June, like, it that's how much I like improved once I kind of realized that okay this is going to be it you know there's no turning back this is this is what the Lord wanted me to live my life like you know and but once I got my mind focused on the right direction like I, I, I excelled through it all and how, being, how long was the rehab process I mean I'm sure it was it was a uh, I, the hardest thing with prosthetics is getting those prosthetics comfortable with your skin like we were just talking yeah you know and you know, the big thing with prosthetics is strengthening up your core and making it strong there. And with me having a below the knee, which I got my knee on one side, helped me out a lot. The hardest thing was trusting the other side with it being above the knee. It was like me operating a computer the whole time. So I had to learn to shift my weight over and, and make sure that that knee's gonna kick through. And, um, and you know, it, honestly, I started at the end of June and I really didn't, start getting on my legs until I went to the blind school in 2008 when I had no oh gosh. when I had no chance to um, and this was summer of 08 too so basically a year later like I would walk on my prosthetics and therapy I'd take them off and go right back to my wheelchair but once I got to the blind school I basically had my legs on from seven in the morning until you know five six at night like I didn't have the chance to take them off and that helped strengthen up my my legs and make them more calloused and used to the prosthetics and um you know once i, I gra graduated from the blind school i let everybody know i was blind you know and this december of 2008 and you know got back to uh san antonio in 2009 and i just uh i started training up for the baton death march which was in the middle of march and um because I, I promised my physical therapist the year before that i would do it and <coughs> And I told the, the lady who was my therapist that I'm gonna walk this and once I'm done with this then I'm putting my medical board in. Because at that time I knew I wanted to re enlist. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I was gonna ask that because at this point in time we're on, we're probably at least halfway, if not over halfway through your I assume that you probably made a four year commitment. Yeah, and that and that's the that's the one thing along you know, the the whole blind school, learning how to walk, do all this stuff on my own, independent mobility, ADL, all this stuff, daily living was all built on me re-enlisting because I had once I started getting my mind pointing in the right direction on those dark days in Bethesda this is the like and, you know the marine that helped me out talked to me each day from a hospital room I, that's when I come to a point was like this is what I want to do I want to help out other severely wounded guys realize that no matter what your injuries are you could still overcome this and you could still live a, a positive life an optimistic life and so 
a lot of those goals, like that, the broad goal I had was to re-enlist and stay in the Marine Corps. You know, and all the smaller goals would, you know, would lead to that. And um, you know, I knew I had to walk. I knew I had to learn everything I could from blind school. You know, emails, um, live on my own, take care of myself, and um, and uh, you know, through it all, like I knew a, a positive attitude, and you know, getting out and doing these events and doing the Baton Death March and marathons is something that the Marine Corps saw. They saw that. I've accepted my injuries and I'm living life to the fullest with a positive attitude and you know through it all it doesn't matter what you you've dealt with in your life if you attack it positively then you can that's the first steps to success it's such an amazing outlook for somebody that that just had to explain that story and what they went through and you know overcoming that I mean I think it's I think it's so admirable that that that's the way that you chose to do because like you said you could have chose the other road you could have chose the dark road mm -hmm. um, you know where where you just shut everybody out and kind of you know did whatever but you you know you immediately chose to re-enlist and when you made that re-enlistment uh, it was the, with the sole purpose of, of helping others correct it was because I realized then that with two prosthetics and vision loss the, the deploying days are over with but you know what, it's, uh, you know, I, I felt like the day that I got hurt, the Lord placed me on a new mission in life, a new patrol, and that's to share my story and live my life to the fullest and inspire others along the way. You know, even though I didn't have it uh, mapped out in my own life, you know, my own journey yet, the Lord above knew where this would take me. Like, He had it all mapped out, and it was my next, it was my objective to go after that, pursue that. And... You know, and that's the one thing I look at today. It's like we always try to find a purpose in life, and I felt like my purpose in life was to share my story, um, inspire others by challenging myself and continue doing what I'm doing. Because I know one thing I learned in the Marine Corps is lead by example. If you lead and you you do everything the right way, if you do it motivatedly, you know, or if you're motivated and you do it the right way, wake up each day, do the right thing, people are going to follow, and people are going to follow the right way. It's like, you know, and... I one story when I was in therapy, I'd come in every day and I'd go to the mat, I'd put my prosthetics on, I'd stand up and I'd walk out. And my therapist told me one day, he's like, Matt, you don't see this, but every day when you put your prosthetics on and you walk out, there's guys down here with no legs doing core work on the floor and they watch you, they watch you walk out. And that's it, you know, it's lead by example. You wait, you do it the right way and people will follow. And That's, and, a, that's an amazing story because you know, like you said, your therapist told you you didn't see it. I'm sure that you probably had no idea that was going on before that. And, no. you know, how, mu how much of an impact that that probably made on all those people's lives is probably, I mean, there's there's no words to go behind that. I mean, because I'm, I'm sure that a lot of those guys were still uncertain of their road ahead as well. Like if, if they were going to try to overcome the way that you did or if they were going to go down the dark path as well. And I'm sure that that was just such a powerful motivation. Yeah, my, my physical therapist, he's somebody that – Unfortunately, I don't talk to him much today, but that's one guy that I hold very close to my heart, you know, from the things that he taught me. I mean, he looked at me that day when I checked into the Center for the Intrepid in San Antonio. He's like, oh, man. Like, he could have given up on me. A blind dude with no legs? How in the world am I going to teach him how to walk? But he accepted the role, and he, you know, and he was uh, he was motivated to make me a better person. And not only, you know, walk the best as I possibly can, but he taught me so much. And, you know, a lot of the lessons that I... I you know, I talk about the day or two stories in particular, the one I just told you, and then another one when I was learning how to walk. Like with double amputations, you tend to walk like your scissor kick. You put one foot in front of the next. And and he could see the frustration on my face because I kept going from the left wall to the right wall. I couldn't walk straight. I didn't want to fall. And he just stopped me. He was like, Matt, just walk. Just put one foot in front of the next. Whatever you do, I'll never let you fall. And I, I thought of that, and like later on in life, I start realizing it's like that's that's life, you know, one right. day at a time. You know, it's like a step. Like I never know what that next step's going to hold, but I'm going to keep walking forward. And like we don't know what tomorrow or the next day is going to hold, but we got to make it through. You know, it, it becomes life becomes like a war of attrition. That's, yeah, that's the way that I relate to it. You know, you just got to keep surviving. You, you know, David and I were talking just last night about all the things that that happen that you don't even really envision happening. Uh, and, and you just have to keep overcoming and you know me and him you know from our perspective we can't even imagine going through the physical issues that you've had through your life and and overcoming that so uh, when you re-enlisted was it for two years four years it was a three year three year three years okay. yeah, through the extended but permanent limited duty which gives it's in the Marine Corps and 
Um, if you're a Purple Heart recipient, you have the opportunity to stay in the Marine Corps as long as you can. You know, depending on your injuries, you can deploy or they'll find a job for you. And, you know, through it all, like, you do the program, you also have the opportunity to get out at any time. Like, if you get into your job oh, and it's like, you know, this to. ain't my job, you know, then then you can... Yeah, I was going to ask you if, you if it was everything that you thought it would be. Like, I know that a lot of things going into it, we think is going to be one way or the other. And then when, whenever you actually get into the process... It could be something completely different from uh, from what you thought. So was it everything that you envisioned it being? It was, and I think for me being hurt at such an, an early age and not really getting experience the full Marine Corps, you know, I think calling it quits on my own and not being forced out medically was the most perfect thing in the world because, you know, I, you know, I got assigned to Wounded Warrior Battalion Camp Lejeune in 2010. Uh, that's where I wanted to go. And I was there until 2012, but in 2011, I got a chance to go to Iraq on a closure trip. And going wow. to that, and you know, going to that closure trip and actually having the chance to walk out of that country, and you know, setting there's a video because I got to take a f American flag. It's a in the um, shadow box there. That American flag I bought in Hawaii. It flew in my um, my barracks room. Took it to Iraq. It flew in in our fob in Iraq. And it went from every hospital that I, you know, was in. And I got a chance to fly that in Iraq in 2011, and it was such a calm day. And when I got the flag to the top of the flagpole, the wind picked up, and I could just hear the flag whipping in the wind. And as I stood underneath that flag, saluting it, like I thought a lot about my life just in the matter of seconds, you know. And the reason why I joined the Marine Corps was to deploy over and over again. And I didn't need. Like I realized I couldn't deploy no more, but I didn't need to be in uniform to share my story because, you know, although, you know, I, I hate walking away from the Marine Corps because I truly love serving this country, the title of Marine is something that I could take to my grave. You know, yeah. once a Marine, always a Marine. And that's something, you know, now I can tell my kids. Later on, I can tell my kids, and when I get my headstone, it's going to say United States Marine on it. So... You know, I did a lot of thinking. I, I met Amanda, my well, then girlfriend, in 2010 when I moved to North Carolina. And so I was starting a family. I was starting school. I was like, you know what? The chapter of being an active duty Marine is, is coming to an end. And it, and it kind of, you know, obviously it wasn't the way that you envisioned it, but I can imagine that kind of being able to go out your way was, was very important. And, it is. You know, it? for moving on with your life. Just make the best of every situation. And that's one thing I, I did in the Marine Corps. And, you know, and... On, on our flight back over, or flight back home from Iraq, we were flying over Iceland, and you know the pilot brought back a little piece of letter that said, "U.S. forces have killed Osama bin Laden." Oh my gosh! And I was like, you know, he's the reason why we all joined the military. Wow! And you know, it's uh, you can't ask for a better ending to a closure trip. Yeah. And and then it's like, you know what? It's that that capped it off, you know. And me and my friend were sitting there on the airplane. We uh had two glasses of champagne and, and one word on that glass, it said it perfectly, united, you know, and we all, again, we all served this country to go after him and from what he, what horror he brought to us on 2000, in 2001. And um, to know that, that he is finally, you know, killed, it, it, it was, that was the best closure. And I, I got that letter somewhere in his study, but it, you know, and so I went home you know, after that, I just wanted to be with my family, and I started school and started going through the whole process of getting out of the Marine Corps. And you know, and first of July, we uh, I went on terminal leave, and we left Camp Lejeune for the last time, and we headed here because my amazing wife, you know, she was like, "You've always wanted to to graduate, go to the University of Kentucky, and graduate from there." And he was like, "Why don't you?" And it gave me the motivation to move back here and start taking classes at UK. Um, and I'm sure that that was an adventure by itself, you know, you know, going back to school, um, you have limitations now with your legs, limitations with your eyes. So what was that process like for you? Was it, was it easy to get back into or was it very difficult to get back in that groove? It, it was harder once I got here because when I was in coastal, at, it was coastal Carolina community college, like in, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, it was set up so perfect for me. Like we had... Amanda would drop me off at the front loop. There was a security guard there to pick me up in a golf cart, take me to my class, and when the class oh, wow, was over, I'm sure it was a pretty small campus, huh? Yeah, and it, like so, it was like I, I was used to that. And when I got here, I started at BCTC, and the disability coordinator wasn't wasn't like like I, she didn't give me the same treatment as I did 
in North Carolina. And, you know, she basically wanted me to walk out of one building down this steep hill <laughs> across the road, across this parking lot to this next class, you know, with the long cane and all this, you know, and, and this is also it's very, fall. very difficult. Yeah. And, and it was just, you know, it was hard, you know, and one of the professors actually became my, she made my schedule and she's like, all right, if you go to Cooper campus, it's so much easier than Lee's town. And, and she started asking students that, that would be willing to walk me from class to class. And she helped out so much. And, um, you know, she looked out for me. And once I got to UK and I got a chance to meet with the Veterans Resource Center or coordinator, and he was the same way. He took care of me and he helped me get from class to class. He provided work studies and he asked in each class if there was somebody that served in the military or if there was a work study or if there's, you know, students in here that'd be willing to take me from class to class or just like wait with me you know, until a work study shows up because the disability center didn't provide that apparently. They just, like they were there if I needed to take a test and they provide some, some scribes to read the test to me. But they didn't provide like assistance mm -hmm. around this massive campus, you know? And yeah, that's crazy. So the, the, Tony from the VRC took me under his wing and if it wasn't for him and those work studies, then I don't, I don't know if I could have made it through UK just because there's one time when we were at Cooper campus on BCTC I had a class at 9.30 in the morning that got out at 10.45 and my next class was like at 1. My wife, with a newborn, had to sit there and wait for me on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Basically walk around, you know, Kroger Field with Layla, you know, I think she was about a year old then, to wait for me to get out of class. She picked me up, you know, we went to go grab lunch and then, like, her whole Tuesdays and Thursdays was ruined because she was waiting on me, which I love her to death for, but you know, just waiting for me. She has a life, you know, and we had a newborn and that was, uh, that was the spring of 2013, I believe it was cold, you know, and it's like yeah. the disability, like they, they didn't look, they, they did a poor job in looking after people that had true disabilities, but you know, and, but we got through it, you know, and once, once I met Tony, he set up a drop-off point, a pick-off point, and That's awesome. and Amanda realized then that that I was in good hands when she dropped me off. You didn't and, have to worry with it so much or, or be back, and yeah, but, that's, that's. But it's along the, like you know along the way, it's like you know I had some amazing professors that would be willing to work with me more. You know, like the whole math lab and working. <laughs> You know, I, I, I hated math when I could see. Now here I'm blind trying to learn how to do fractions and all this other stuff. It's I can't like, even imagine oh that, goodness, man. Like I told you, I was in a stupid math class, so. I tell you, and it was like this teacher would like meet with me and like we would, she would go step by step and I knew it step by step, you know, and I could tell her like, all right, do this, do this. <coughs> but she knew how to work with me and, you know, I, I, I think I passed her class with the, with the low B, but then I went through, um, Introduction to statistics and statistics, and I think I passed both those with an A, just because the first the the professor was willing to, take, to that set, extra time. take that extra time to sit down with me and like go over this stuff and understand that okay I'm blind how can I make it better and more more accessible for him and uh, you know it's along the on, along the way when I was at BCTC and then when I was at UK like these these professors were amazing you know and they they took extra time for me and that really meant a lot. Yeah, and so you transitioned there um, to to UK to to finish it. Is that right? I was. I was the one thing that I've been blessed with is trying to find the purpose in life. And you know, from graduating high school straight into the Marine Corps, from Marine Corps straight into school, graduating from UK and going straight into a job. Like I never had time to sit back and think about like what is next. You know, I've been blessed with the having that set up. And um, you know, I graduated from UK in May of 2017 with multiple degrees in history and media arts. And you know, it's a uh, I. I always tell people that, I, you know, I speak to high school kids today, it's like, you know, everything I learned in college is stuff, stuff that I should have learned in high school. Right. You know, and like, I love to sit down and read a book now. And like, I loved going through college. And my, me in high school would have never said that. Right, you know? right. It's like, yeah. I try to find ways to even get out of school for a day, you know. And so, um, so you said history and media arts. I, I don't know what you what you envisioned your job being once you got out of college, but do you want to talk about your job currently? Uh, when I when I started at UK, actually when I started school altogether, like, like I knew I was, you know, I'm 100% disabled. 
So like trying to find a job to f- put food on the table wasn't, you know, it wasn't a priority because I knew that I'd have a paycheck. Right. And I was like, you know, I love sports. So, so it gave you a little bit of freedom. To yeah, like give me like, your wanna, passion. Yeah, I want to do like a radio show, you know, and just something to keep me busy. And um, so I do a podcast. Well, <laughs> you know, I thought of that, and people was mentioning it too. But you know, I, I'm a little. Uh, it may be something here in the future. Strap like for that. time, probably. You yeah, probably it's a, but I would love to do that, you know. And well, I think I can speak for David and saying any time that you ever want to be on ours, yeah, we'll, just we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> talk about yeah. sports or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that's why that's why I went with media arts, you know, because that's, that's something that I focused on. You know, I got I got pushed around a little bit. You know, started with communications, journalism, and then went on to media arts and. I stuck with history just because a lot of the classes to fill and fill up a, a credit. I just like you know let's do a history class and I love history so I used that as and uh, I think it was like a year to go at UK and I was like I only need a couple more hours of history classes to actually complete the degree and I'm like well might as well just go for it you know and but uh, you know it's uh, I interned my last year at UK with uh, Congressman Barr's office and this position opened up we were a fellowship program and. Um, I, in, you know, intern there, and the, the guy that was working in the D.C. office looked at me and was like, Matt, won't you just intern with us, and once this position opens up, or once your internship is done, then you can apply for the position, and I applied for it and got the job, and so I've been doing that for a little, almost two years now, just kind of doing veterans outreach, working with veterans, and, and you know, and it's it's amazing to get out, and, you know, I share my story with these veterans, and they just see that I go to work day in and day out, and and a lot of them have become really good friends and you know it, it, it truly is humbling and it means a lot and it, you know it's, it's almost emotional when you yeah. have a 70 year old Vietnam veteran walk up to you and it's like you inspire me you know and it's just and that's that's one thing I've hope it never gets old because it, it I think that everybody says it truly means it I, I told you before we started there's days that I don't feel like working out um, whatever it may be I'll see my shirt you know I'm wearing your shirt right now um, and I'll see my shirt or I'll see a post that you make and I'm like, man, I can't, you know, I can't have any excuses today. I got to get out there and do it. And it's, it, it's very inspiring. Um, and, and it's in your story, not only just inspires to one particular person, I think it's, I think it inspires across the board. You know, that's the, the one thing I focus a lot on, you know, it's cause you, we all have challenges and we all realize that life's a mountain, you know, it's going to be a climb. It's not easy. It's not a fairy tale, you know, and you got to realize that through life and through challenges, you got to work hard. You got to be dedicated. And, you know, honestly, at the end of the day, if you have a positive attitude, you know, you can overcome these things. It's, uh, you know, when I do give speeches, I talk about adapt and overcome. You know, I had to adapt and overcome. I had to, I had to learn to get used to these prosthetics and this vision loss, adapt and figure out a way how to overcome them. And that's one thing I've focused on. And it's, uh, but it's it's just life's a struggle, and we got to realize that, you know, if you make a mistake today, you put your head down at night, and you go to sleep, you wake up, it's a brand new day, and um, so that's a and that's one thing I try to teach a lot of like kids when I give a lot of high school speeches and stuff like that, and it's just uh, there's a lot of people in this world that need a positive influence and a role Absolutely. model to look up to. There's not and, enough of it right now. Exactly, and it's just you know it's I've seen what. Iraq looked like and I've seen you know what what it, what you can how you can handle like being in the dumps of situations and being depressed and guilt and it's like you think back it's like we live in the United States of America we live in the you know the free country with all these freedoms that we have it's like why wake up and be depressed and why be down in the dumps right. it's like you know it's there's so much that we could do you know it's just you just got to go out and do it and there's a I know that we're kind of pressed by time and I think our battery's done as well, but there's a couple more things that I kind of wanted to talk to you about. And I know that your story and your inspirations open a lot of doors for you. And David was very curious to see what your White House visit was like. Um, so if you want to talk on that a minute. <laughs> that was, uh, I will say, that, um, when I went to Afghanistan last December, the, the, the guy that was in charge of the, the, group, the foundation, and the, he put in my name to the uh, Secretary of the VA. <coughs> and, you know... For the last 12 years, everything that I've tried to talk about, my message and stuff, was just to, to get people to go out and live their life to the fullest, living right. on their bare minimal, you know, and to be recognized for something that I'm passionate about, you know, and like basically be recognized for living my life to the fullest. 
truly meant the world to me and you know and for the city of the union address I, I didn't think it would ever happen because we had a shutdown last january too right, and, right. and i kind of knew a little bit about it but the wednesday for the city of union um i got the call and wow. it was like man, that fast huh yeah it was like somebody that worked in the white house and it's so funny like she was like would you be interested in attending the state of the union as the president's guest and i was like well yeah and so, <laughs> so like during that time i put my phone on speaker so my the guy i work with can hear it and the minute i put it on speaker she's like whatever you do don't tell nobody oh and no I'm like, All right, let me get this off speaker, like, so I, I took it off and that was uh i mean that was wednesday and the hardest thing was not telling anybody i can't imagine you know and so we flew there sunday and then by Monday afternoon when the, the media released it, I was like, I gave my phone to my wife. I was like, here. I mean, just text messages, Facebook messages, yeah, Twitter, Twitter messages. all that stuff. Just like and then you, had, you posted the picture with the president as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, the whole, the coolest thing, like my wife loved the motorcade. She thought that was the coolest thing. But Oh, so you're actually in the motorcade? Yeah. Oh, that's and, wild. And on Wednesday, because Tuesday at like, we had to be at the White House by 12 or something like 12, 1230. So Tuesday at like 11, uh, my dad's contact because Fox News is like contacting <coughs> everybody in my family. And oh my then, lord! And then they finally get a hold of my dad and like, so they're like, "We want you to be, we want to interview you tomorrow morning." And we were originally to fly out Wednesday morning, so here we are in like an hour. My wife's trying to get all this like logistics because I don't have a suit, <laughs> I don't have anything other than oh, my lord. uniform, and like she's trying to plan all this stuff out, keep me here overnight, and. Blah, blah, blah. It's yeah, like, I actually took a picture of you at the State of the, uh, the Union, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I posted to Facebook. I'm, I don't know if you if you knew about it or anything. Oh, that was the one from a couple days ago? No, no, no. That was one from when it happened. So, oh, okay. Yeah, I posted a picture of it. I was like, man, it's just wild to see somebody that you know I've actually interacted with being in that position, and, and it's just, it, it was... Once in a lifetime opportunity. That's why I told my wife, like, this is truly, like, is an honor that, I don't know if any honors can get any higher than this, yeah. you know? and doesn't matter if you like him. You're carrying Kentucky and Winchester on your back there. There's a lot of people proud that day, regardless of who the president is or anything exactly. else. Exactly, and that's that's the one thing I had to learn with all this. It's like, you know what, it's, uh, you know, I, I don't like being called, like, a public figure or being that, you know. I just like living my life, you know, the way I want to live it. But I've, I've been given this platform, and this platform is to share this inspiration and motivation to encourage others to live beyond their bare minimum, you know, push themselves and challenge themselves. And I've yeah. accepted that, and and I think you know the greatest thing in the world is to just that keeps me going each and every day is to hear people walk up and say I'm inspired by you and I'm gonna go do this. I had a kid in 2009 on the USS George Washington walk up to him. He's like, you know, just hearing your story. And I didn't have much of a story then. He was like, I want to, I you know, after hearing your story, I want to. Re I've been I've reenlisted. I'm gonna reenlist and. He's like, I called my dad and told him, I was like, oh gosh, I hope your dad don't know my name. You know? It's like, it's like, but it's like, you know, I've been given this platform and I found my purpose in life. And for me, that's, that's the most important thing. And, you know, and, and now it's like, you know, I told you earlier about the legs, amputations was the worst thing in the world, but now having a wife and kids and not be able to see some of the most important things in my life. Yeah, is I was that, gonna ask about that, but yeah. The vision, you know, it's like, if I can just have yeah. my vision back for a couple of days, just see what my family looks yeah, like, you know, and and it's- uh, Well, you have a beautiful family, man. And, 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 and a beautiful house, everything. And you saw, like my daughter, she she has, she takes care of me, yeah. you know, she'll, if I need something, she'll get it for me, and our kids If you don't are, quit, you're gonna make cry, man. <laughs> uh, I mean, our, our kids are just truly amazing, you know, and it's, yeah. I always tell a story about my, uh, he's my stepson, but I, you know, he's my son, you know, and two years ago, he's playing at a birthday party, he's giving out invitations at school, and there's this girl there that had no arms or legs, and he didn't know her, he never interacted with her at all, but he walked up and wanted to give her an invitation, and it's like, if, if, I, if I can teach anything in life, it's right there, that's the answer, it's like, you know what, the kids are learning from, from me going out and, you know, accepting my injuries and overcoming these injuries and living life, and letting them know that through hard work and through dedication and just living your life, being motivated and having positive attitude it's just it can overcome anything and you know and you got to be compassionate you got to care for others and him doing that just i mean when i do speak about it it brings tears to my eyes yeah absolutely you know? and, it's just, and i'm sure that that i mean i feel like that that's pretty much the perfect way to end everything is to is to give that message and i'm sure that it's a message that you said that you still have dark moments i'm sure little tidbits like that are what bring you through your dark moments and to know that you made the difference in all of these people's lives around you and you know 
the fact that not only are you touching people's lives that are immediately around you, but it's starting to it's starting to be a domino effect where it, it mm -hmm. spreads out so much, you know, through Winchester and through your children. And I that's mean, it's the, just, the one thing I always tell people is if I can inspire and motivate one person a day, then my job is complete. Absolutely. And you know, it's and there's four in this house right here each and every day. And you know, as a youngster, I mean, you look at the kids that have like handicapped or disabled. Like I never took time to go say hi to them or be around them, you know. And yeah, I was and, a I was a peer tutor, so that's actually one thing that I did right in my life. I um, I was around a lot. And Lee, my friend that has autism, he still comes to my house and stays. And you know, it's just it's one of those things that I always did take time for. But you know, now it's given me given me such more so much more of an appreciation for veterans and your all's mm -hmm. struggle. And and you know, it it literally brings tears to my eyes whenever you're talking about not being able to, to see your family and, and you know, I think that so many of us take it for granted and, yeah, and that's let those moments pass by. And that's what I feel like with our kids here. They're like helping me out and seeing my dis disabilities and learning from it and learning that we're all still humans. We all right. have a heart and we all have, you know, we're all people and that's the, you know, and, and they've been around a lot of guys with injuries mm -hmm. and amputations and burns and stuff. And but, now they know how to handle it. But they, they see how these guys act and the positivity and how optimistic they are in life. It's just and, infectious. I tell you what, it, we joke about our injuries so much, you know. Yeah. Like I got to speak to my, my uh, Emma, my stepdaughter. daughter. She uh, used to invite me to her class and I'd speak there and like, and those kids just love it, you know. A prosthetic guy, I take my left leg and flip it all the way around, you know. And it's, uh, <laughs> and the one thing that we do, and. Uh, I know we're cutting on time here, but the one thing that we do a lot is when uh, when a kid like, mommy, look at his legs. And you know, the parents are always, they don't know how to look no, at that, but, but they always like try to shoo their kids away. And one thing that me and my wife always do is like, you know, we like, look at his leg. It's like a computer, you know, it's like you charge it up with your phone every night. And it's just, uh, it's amazing. You know, and yeah. we, gotta, we gotta make sure that these, these young kids under, understand that we're in war, we've been in war and there's a lot of people with amputations, a lot of burns and you know, it's not to look at them and point at them. It's just to walk up and shake their hand and let them know that, yeah, they don't that really, you still support them. They just so. want to feel like they're a part of everyday life. And, and I think that you facilitated that and you've definitely brought a new light with your story to, to help uh, making that happen. Um, you know, and, and your social media pages are one of the best ways to do that. Uh, kind of in closing here, um, do you want to share how people can find you? Um, on, on Facebook, um, Matthew Bradford, Twitter, at Bionic Matt Five, and then my Instagram, I think M underscore Bradford underscore USMC. I, I just recently got an Instagram about a year ago because I always felt like I'm blind. Why do I need to sit there and look at pictures? So I don't need right, Instagram. Yeah. But, but you share your videos and stuff on there, and, yeah. and people can see those and make inspirations. And we're in the process of, oh, actually, it's I think it's launched, but we haven't announced it yet. But our website and stuff like that for like speaking engagements and shirts and you know all the stuff. Are you going to announce that on your social media pages or do you probably take the time to do that now? Or? Uh, I'll probably announce it on there okay. as well but I mean I'll, we could we got a website and I, I can't I don't know the, the okay. link or anything. And but. they can and they can is there still a link to get your shirts and stuff on on social social media? Do you yeah. saw that? Yep, it's all yeah. going to be there and everybody gonna... that wants to see the hashtag no legs no vision no problem. Uh, I'm wearing the shirt right now. I have a couple of them. They're awesome, good quality. Uh, so definitely go check those out make sure that you follow matt um you know he should have about a hundred thousand more followers than what he does especially with the with the message that um that you send and i'm sure that uh in closing here uh it's it's hilarious like um it's been about 12 minutes ago but i just got a message that jocko just responded to to the, um, to the twitter message i felt my <laughs> my phone's been vibrating over here yeah and, so that yeah. that was actually one of the things so you're actually going to go on the jocko podcast um do you, do you have a set date for that or do you know a timeline i think it's april 1st if that's a monday then but yeah it's uh when we fly to la we're going to disneyland and once we land, we're uh, we're gonna do the Jocko podcast that day. So. Perfect, and I'm sure that you know he'll definitely help you get those followers up. And I know he's been an inspiration in my life. I listen to a lot of his sound bites or yeah. his podcasts when I work out and things like that. So, uh, and you know, don't be afraid to tell Jocko that you got to do Kellen's podcast first and, and make sure that you yeah. shout that out for us. I hope he took some notes. I wonder Double if he commented on that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can read it right now. Yeah. It might be the first time in history you get to read a Jocko quote on a your own podcast he said right on matt fastball <laughs> oh yeah, yeah the famous perfect. fastball you know perfect. perfect so that's a perfect way to end it we appreciate it so much man Thank uh you. you guys make sure that you go out there 
and uh, you know, like, uh, share, subscribe to, uh, to our channel, share this video, uh, get Matt's story out there to as many people because it brings so much light, uh, so much positivity to my own life and to so many people's around us. And you know, definitely need to get that message out there. So uh, we appreciate you uh, being on here, man, and we Thank appreciate you. everybody from uh, for watching. And uh, until next time, we'll see you later.